Journey into comics. Poor entertainment. Poor news. Foodies watching movies. Adults and gaming. Podcast read the voice of survival. Kids for sale. Gallif Radio. Brews with dudes. Journey into wrestling. Journey into comics network. Journeyintocomics.com. The following, following. the following is a journey into comics. Journey into comics. It's a journey into comics. It's a journey into comics. Journey into comics. Journey into comics. Network. 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 Production. Production. Hey guys, Dick here from Podcastrophy Podcast, and you are listening to the best of the Journey into Comics Network, where we take the best of each episode from the week and we highlight it for you and bring it to you in the form of this podcast today. So, uh, if you want, you know. You know, just uh, take a breather, relax, listen to the best of the Journey into Comics Network. And, you know, just do me a favor. Just do me one solid favor. Try to make every day a big dick day. Thanks, guys. And here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Journey into Comics. I finished Titans. Holy shit. I'm not going to spoil it. I just want to say a few quick things on this show. Great story. The season is 11 episodes. Every episode sets up something. Everything has a purpose and a reason and and, and so on and so forth. Uh, There's a crazy reveal after credits. They leave you on a... I don't really want to say a cliffhanger, but man, they just... Oh, they they just built the tension beautifully. You get to see Batman in this universe, Joker, Riddler, Two-Face. I'm not going to say how or why. I'm just going to leave you there. It's kind of like a jizz factory to take it back to last week's poor entertainment or to last week's uh, podcastrophe, both of which the word jizz factory was dropped. I don't know why that's a thing on the network now, but it came from my mouth one day, and here we are. So anyways, folks... Uh, if you haven't yet checked out Titans, I do strongly encourage you to do so because you won't be disappointed. You're going to have uh, an interesting journey across the board because it just, you know, if you have no expectations on what to what you think you're going to get out of the show, when you watch it, you're going you just end up going, oh man, I fucking loved it. It was it was brilliant. Like I I couldn't have I couldn't have planned for that to be the case. And they set they they do a great job of doing the foundation building. They've now set the foundation. So I'm looking forward to see what Titans does in the future here. Uh, I've got a little bit of news here to get out of get ourselves out of here before we go. Uh, and I want to talk about something. One thing I'm going to do uh, in the year of 2019 is there's this list. It's got like 50 some movies on it, right? How many movies? Is, what's the total number? It's 50. So the first two weeks, I'm not going to do this, but in 20, like the middle of 2019, I'm going to start this thing, and we're going to talk about every Marvel movie ranked from awful to amazing as per what comicbook.com ranks them and um, a little bit of Metacritic scores and whatnot. And I think, I think that's actually what they're basing them on is just the Metacritic score. Most of these movies I have seen, some I have not. We're going to dish on them one at a time, just a little bit here and there. That's all I got to say about that. You guys, Aquaman opened at the box office this weekend to a $67.4 million opening weekend. Uh, it beat Mary Poppins Returns and Bumblebee. It earned $28 million on Friday and is just doing really well overseas. It seems that it uh, people like it. Uh, now, I say it seems that people like it because, interestingly enough, to counter that, Aquaman's critics reviews have dropped all the way to 63%, meaning that critics are starting to kind of not dig it as much or have things to say about it. Maybe they're finding flaws, but audiences are loving this. This is yet again, you're almost in that Venom territory. Now, Venom got shit on by the critics and a lot of fans and then some good, but um, let's read this here real quick. Uh, Aquaman has proven to be another divisive DCEU movie for critics and fans. The aggregate site Rotten Tomatoes revealed Aquaman's initial tomato meter score. The film had a 78% fresh rating. It would have been enough to earn the film a certified fresh seal of approval from the website. However, additional reviews for the film have dragged the score down a bit. Its tomato meter is now at 64%, which is still fresh, 
but not enough to get a certified fresh batch. The Rotten Tomatoes critical consensus for Aquaman reads, Aquaman swims with its entertainingly ludicrous tide, offering up CGI superhero spectacle that delivers energetic action with an emphasis on good old-fashioned fun. So, and then of course, it's cinema score gives it an A-. minus. I don't know, it's weird. I want to see Aquaman. I want to see it really soon. That's going to be my plan Hopefully before 2019, I need to get to the theaters, maybe make it a day where I watch both Into the Spider-Verse and Aquaman, because I need to review those for you guys and and dish on them. Also, I want to mention that briefly, something really cool has been brought out from from, uh, Warner Brothers. But Warner Brothers, on an episode of DC Daily, unveiled from the Warner archives the... One of the prototype suits that Nick Cage would have wore as Superman, and it is fucking gorgeous. I love it. I just looked at it, and it's just like, damn. It's just a awesome-looking suit here. We have a little bit of Star Wars news, a couple, three little topics here, and then we're going to move it over to an interview that Veronica and I did at LaFiCon before Christmas with J. Wolf Scott here. A little bit of Star Wars news, as it seems that we're getting a time jump uh, many Star Wars fans not used to big time, time jumps between installments in the Skywalker saga. The fact the only film that didn't have a significant gap was The Last Jedi picking up right after The Force Awakens. So we are, yeah. The next film is getting back to basics and embracing tradition, reporting that there's going to be a one-year time jump. So, cool. I'm looking forward to that. I love Star Wars. We're a little less than a year away from new Star Wars. John Boyega had something to say. The way that they've been shooting it right now is looser than the, before the light the last two times. Oh, Oscar Isaac said, sorry. Oh, we can try things. And it's a testament to J.J. coming back and feeling confident. There's less pressure for it to be right. We just want to make a good movie and have a really good time while we're doing it. So, man, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I was trying to read where it said the thing about whatever. It doesn't matter. Guys, we're getting a time jump. And also, Natalie Portman is apparently not going to appear in this movie. There was rumors she was going to be a part of it. That's not happening. I just want to say we really need a Star Wars podcast on our fucking network. I really want to dive into Star Wars, and I feel like I can only kind of brief on it today because I'm running a little bit long for a typical JIC, but I really wanted to get us back to basics, get us talking about The Walking Dead get us hyped for what's to come in 2019 in the, in the comic book world. And folks, I think that's going to do it. I am going to take uh, myself out of the pr- the picture now and say later, I'm going to send it on over to Nate right now, who is at LaFiCon Live with Veronica and Julie Wolf Scott. We are here at LaFiCon Live for the LaFiCon after Christmas. Joining me as always, well not as always, but as often as we can have it, welcome back Veronica, how's it going? I'm good, thanks for having me again. Good to have you. Uh, Today we have a very special guest, Yeah. uh, Julie Wolf Scott, author of The Children of Aberon, did I do it right? Awesome, that's awesome, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, Welcome to the show, Julie. Well, thank you for having me. We're so so excited to be talking to you. Absolutely. We were driving down this morning, and uh, we got linked to your stuff, and we were checking out your book. It seems like a very interesting series that is very large. You've written a lot of content for this. It, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a, quite a journey. Um, we moved to Muncie about 20 years ago. I grew up in Lafayette, um, and, and the really cool thing about it is It's just been such an amazing journey because locally we have a legend about a young girl. Her name was Elizabeth Ball that was daughter of George and Francis Ball, very wealthy family, you know, Ball Jars, Mm -hmm. Ball University, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And what happened was she believed that there were fairies living in her backyard. Believed this her entire life, never married, lived in the house Oakhurst all her life. So I started asking the question, well, what if she was right? And what would it look like in modern-day Muncie, Indiana, if somebody started seeing strange things in Elizabeth's garden? Oh, that's so cool. It was originally going to be a short little fairy tale for our daughter, and, you know, just a little book. Well, it, the fairies had other ideas, and it just kind of <laughs> took off. I was, um, because I have 30 years in the graphics industry, I do my own graphics, I do my own interiors, so I was able to basically put out a book every four to six months um, for the first five books because wow. the ideas just kept flowing and, and everything. you were doing the legwork, so obviously you could put them out at your 
pace. Really. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so let's take it back to the very beginning of the journey for people who don't know you. Where does your love and passion for being a writer come from? Like, What inspired you to go down this path? Well, the funny thing about it is we moved to the country. We had gone from living in town. The children were, you know, just starting to transition into middle school. We had 248 channels. You know, you go from that down to 12 channels on satellite. We had two church channels, two shopping channels, and the networks, nothing on. So I spent a lot of time on the lawn tractor listening to Jimmy Buffett music, you know, because Jimmy's... uh, prolific storyteller and so you spend enough time on the lawn tractor you start letting (laughs) things roll through your head you know you come up with your own stories well in the meantime I would dance out on the lawn with my cowboy hat and my weed whacker (laughs) and we had friends coming up the highway and they said hey we saw you out dancing in your yard I said oh no that was Desdemona my lawn girl (laughs) And, and so I started having these ideas and it got to the point where it was just a chunk here and a chunk there and it just kept bubbling up and all of a sudden I realized there was a story there and so what I ended up doing was just starting to write things down carrying a notebook with me everywhere and what was fun about it was it took me about two years but I ended up writing a novel that was over a hundred and 19,000 words wow. so yeah so it, my Whoa. first my first book was like 400 and some odd pages wild. it's um it's a cautionary tale that I'd written for our daughter she uh, I finished it on her 16th birthday and what was really fun about it was um you know I thought oh this is going to change my life this is you know I'm going to be a best-selling author <laughs> couldn't find representation for that thing anywhere so it sat in a in a drawer for two years and then, um, you know, of course, the, the Kindle came online, and, and that was just the big thing this Christmas. And I had just quit my job, and my husband had sent me an email about Amanda Hawking. She was very prolific with zombie novels, you know, was selling those buggers for 99 cents a pop. In 10 months' time, she made over a million dollars. And I'm like, wow, well, I can do that. Mm-hmm. So I, okay, you know, you wrote this novel, it's huge, so let's go ahead and, and, and publish it to Kindle because I can't get a, an agent, so okay. So I learn how to program for Kindle, and I go through the learning process, you know, makes you feel like a rocket scientist because, hey, I do HTML, <laughs> which is, you know, easier than what you think. And so I went ahead and formatted it. I uploaded it to Amazon. I sent texts to all my friends. I'm published on Kindle. And they're like, great, that's awesome. Nobody had a Kindle. What's Kindle, Uh yeah. Yeah, it was like I knew two people that had a Kindle, and one of them was me. You know. That was at a time, too, I think, you probably speaking, when the Kindle like first came out, it was the black and white screen, very, mm-hmm. very low tech, mm-hmm. just for books. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just for books. Oh, it's amazing how that has evolved as it is. It's right. crazy with what books are like now, yeah. and we're going to get into that. But continue on your story, yeah. sorry. So anyway, you know, I was like, that. the learning curve with that was how not to publish a book. So I had to back up, go ahead and reformat it for, for print. Mm-hmm. and all that stuff and it eventually pushed it out you know and even then it's easier to sell books in person than it is online because you get into the sludge of the algorithm and you know if you don't sell books you sink that's right it's so, all fixed but even okay. going into a bookstore it's it's so overwhelming because there's just so many things to choose from right so anyway Um, In the meantime, I started working in a furniture store and was working 10 hours a day, 11 hours a day. I would get up at 4 in the morning. I'd write for two hours. I'd come home after work, you know, kiss the kids, send them to bed, blog. And I I didn't realize that I was doing so much until my sister-in-law said, Wow, you really fit it all into your day. You do this and this. And I'm like, Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> but but the first five books of the series, I put a, a book out from beginning to write it until having it in my hands completed every four to six months. Wow. 
That's some really intense work ethic and dedication on your part. It, 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 it was more to keep my sanity because, you know, you get so many ideas in your head and unless... You have to get them out. Yeah, because otherwise they go away. Right. And, and it's, you never know what's going to yield a really great... Right. Something. Right. Well, and the first impression is always the best, you know, mm-hmm. and so I got to the point where I was obsessive about carrying notebooks with me and making sure that I had some place to jot things down and Smart. and just kind of capture those those ideas. So it's been a little tougher <clears throat> here lately to get in, back into the 4 a.m. thing. But, um, I can um, imagine. <laughs> yeah. Especially being more established now. I mean, how many books do you have out total? Um, there's seven books in this series, and then uh, First Wish was the first book that I'd written. Um, I've done a couple of digital books only. One's about my writing journey. The other one is just a short story. <clears throat> but I'm getting ready to put another book out after the first of the year. So, um, Are we allowed so to talk about that? Right? Ten. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, because I know the publisher really well. <laughs> We interrupt the Journey into Comics Network feed for this late-breaking edition of Poor News, featuring Andrew Poor. Everyone in America, and really everyone in the world, seems to be getting a lot more thin-skinned. Everyone keeps calling each other snowflake, regarding, regardless of what side you're on, what's going on. If you can't have a compelling argument against something happening, the other person is a snowflake for getting offended by whatever you're saying. I've seen people call... Liberal snowflakes, we would call conservative snowflakes. I've just seen it just go back and forth. And are we all just snowflakes? Is everyone just getting too thin-skinned to put up with a Christmas song or a border wall or whatever it is that people are upset about? And don't get me started on this whole border wall thing or this GoFundMe where it's already raised like almost $5 million. Which is funny enough, though, that I saw recently on Twitter that they said they were almost to $5 million, which is half of their... $1 $1 billion goal, so at least their math skills are on point, right, everyone? But like I said, I feel like everyone has just become so thin-skinned. I've watched so many interesting Twitter posts that the comments will just get bloody and calling everyone a snowflake or entitled all this back and forth, and it's just nonsense. So I kind of wanted to do some digging to figure out why... Sorry, because like, I brush a lot of this stuff off. It doesn't bother me. Like, the whole thing with, um, Baby It's Cold Outside or so that. It's like, okay, it's a song from a different generation. You can't look at something from the past and putting it in modern con- If someone tried to re-release a new version of that song, sure, then be upset about it. But the 40s was a different time. I think that's when it came out, the 40s. It's been quite a long time ago. It's like taking offense to a Peanuts comic strip from 1952. Cool, you don't like it, but it was, it's was it been 60 years. Just calm down. I don't know. But I feel like just everyone is getting so thin-skinned. I don't get what the point is. Just don't worry about it. If it's not a big deal, don't make a big deal out of it. People just keep making mountains out of molehills, and I think we just need to move forward and not nitpick or fight about the small stuff and focus on the big stuff. We're almost into 2019. That's where our focus should be. Not about this little inner squabbling about things that don't really matter. I don't know. That's just my two cents. I got two articles here I'm going to talk about that I feel encompasses that I'm going to go into since the end of the year, some 2018 year in review, and then kind of transition out of it. So, yeah. So this will be the last poor news of 2018. 2019 is going to bring some big changes to myself and probably the network as a whole, but we'll kind of see where that ball lays after we play it. So, but jumping in, this is an article I found from... These are both from early this year because I was trying to find an article that kind of talked about it. This is an article from the Daily Campus uh, by Karen Blownstein. It says, either everyone is a snowflake or none of us are. This is an opinion article. I just found it kind of interesting. Um, so let's see. Uh, Linda Sarsour, a social activist and women's march organizer, was invited to speak at UConn Women's Center on Wednesday, March 7th. While the event was canceled at the last minute due to weather conditions, it triggered a great deal of controversy on campus. The event's main focus is the women's right and advocacy for gender equality. So Sara Sara, a co-chair of the 2017 Women's March, was a well-suited speaker to host. It's important to recognize and emphasize her progressive bona fides, but to also recognize the disapproving 
of her advocacy does not make an individual opposed to all of her views. Sarsour's relatively popular views regarding the Women's March and against racially racially profiling terrorism are not the reason for controversy, but her advocacy towards more sensitive political topics. Most of the disagreement with Sarsour comes from her aggressive anti-Israel beliefs, which is highly likely to directly offend or threaten Israeli students and Jewish life on campus. Taking into account the bold anti-Semitic incidents take, taken on campus, especially one that took place in September of 2017 near the Hillel House, a car drove by a student near Hillel on campus and the girl sitting on the back seat yelled derogatory comments at a student wearing a kippah. I'm not sure what a kippah is, but okay. With aggressive encounters like this occurring, it's important that the university's administration ensure that every student feels safe and comfortable when a speaker with radical views like Sarsour is invited to speak. Similarly to Ben Shapiro, views held by Sarsour pose a threat to students which should be taken seriously by the university. The administration made the decision to send out emails offering the full support of mental health services with the arrival of Shapiro. They should have done the same for Sarsour. Otherwise, the university is presenting a bias in the support it offered to the student body. And while some students feel safe and welcome, some may feel even more threatened. Expressing radical views should not be banned on or avoided on campus, but fairly conducted to optimize student safety on campus. With this in mind, it also is also very natural for people to be offended by many political views, especially in a college environment. The term snowflake, for example, is a strategy used by radical speakers to delegitimize the offenses taken by people who disagree with or are threatened by their beliefs. Despite popular belief, this notion goes both ways, liberal and conservatives. The conflict between these two groups has grown beyond political discrepancies and towards outright uh, detestation of one another, which inevitably leads to labeling and profiling individuals who take offense from a given argument. Instead of accusing those who are offended by a given view of being too sensitive and labeling them snowflakes, people with opposing views should focus on advocating their beliefs without attacking the opposition. In reality, a person cannot be distinguished as a snowflake because everyone can take offenses from everything. If people who are threatened by radical arguments are snowflakes, then everyone is a snowflake. A person that is not threatened by anything simply does not exist, and a belief is not a belief if it is universally agreed or disagreed upon. Rather than labeling those who take offense from certain radical beliefs, institutions should ensure safety despite the presence of radicalism, and that individuals who are threatened are fully supported and have a place where their violences are heard, or their voices are heard. Now, I there's good takeaways. Like the last couple paragraphs of this lesson, I really don't think there should be like emotional support services when a speaker that you disagree with comes on campus, that seems a little extreme, a little like coddling someone who's at least 18 to 22 if they're on a college campus and should be grown enough to handle a large speaker. Yes, people shouldn't be inflamed or justified in doing um, actions if they were kind of feel empowered by that speaker. That's a whole other thing, but I feel like like I've when I was in college, speakers came to campus. I sat in the audience of two um, Republican candidates of the twenty twelve election cycle. Uh, Mitt Romney came to my campus. And I sat through that, and Rick Santorum came to campus, and I or not came. He came to the city I was in, and I went to that. Just wasn't. Pro, I just I've never sat in on a presidential speech and. Republican Cancel Leone, who came, actually, I think, went to three of the four Republican candidates at the time. I went with, saw Romney, um, Romney Santorum, um, Ron Paul, because he went to U of I and I was close enough to it. Only thing I didn't see was Newt Gingrich at the time, but it's Newt Gingrich who really cares. But that was kind of, uh, like, you can see people you disagree with. I remember... When I was sitting next to, I was sitting next to a friend at the time at that Mitt Romney um, speech, and the person who was a friend of mine um, had a question for him. And looking back, it was kind of a little embarrassing just because of the what it did. But um, she stood up and said, um, "You talk about um, making people happy, or the." happy life for Americans, and she said, no, what would be happy would be free birth control, and he said something to the effect of, if you want free birth control, go with the other guy. I personally don't think birth control should be free. I, That's just my two cents. I, 
nothing should be free. Maybe it shouldn't be taxed the same way everything else is. The same way like the pink tax is going around about how feminine hygiene products shouldn't be taxed. But I feel like everything is taxed, so I don't know. But maybe it shouldn't be taxed, but I don't think it should be free by any means. Or That's just my two cents. But it's embarrassing, but like everyone's entitled to their opinion, and you shouldn't be able to delegitimize their opinion based on your opinion. It's just kind of how I feel about it. But... I don't know, a lot of people are just thin-skinned, so they'll find issues with that, or people, like, regarding the, like, Planned Parenthood, people are upset about that. It's just, I don't know, things are just, people are just too upset about certain things. Uh, here's another article from the Californian. Um, America has become a nation of victims. The land of the free and the home of the brave is now the land of the aggrieved and the home of the picked on. The modern United States is no longer e pluribus unum. Sadly, it's become, hey, I was wrong, get my lawyer on the phone. Or recently, south of the Mason-Dixon line, let's grab clubs and tiki torches and go make trouble. America has become a nation of victims. The people who, a decade ago, might have scoffed at the idea that others who were victimized by societal norms, generational poverty, and institutional racism now have, have now themselves joined the pity party and donned the cloak of victimhood. Nursing a grudge is now not just for minorities. Sorry, my article kind of freaked out for a second gotta love ads. America's now become a nation of victims. The same people who a decade ago might have scoffed the idea that others were being victimized. Oh, I kind of read that part already. Nursing grudges are not just for minorities anymore. Conservative white males have gotten in on the act. As they rail against globalization, corporate greed, immigration, political correctness, the anti-confederate statue lobby, affirmative action, and the man in the moon. Those over years shrugged off the notion that they were lingering racial and ethnic dis- Ethnic discrimination against Latinos and African Americans now insists that they are rampant to reverse discrimination against white people. As they often do, politicians make the situation worse by giving people easy outs. And these days, as always, many people are glad to have excuses for their failures, setbacks, and shortcomings. The bad guys are the banks, the rich, the corporations, the immigrants, the global market. Victim anthems have been penned by Bruce, Bruce Springsteen, who in concert has introduced his haunting ballad Youngstown about the battered town in northeast Ohio, it's a story about losing everything, even when you work hard and play by the rules. A couple of generations ago, America survived tough times by hustling, believing in themselves and working harder. Today, this is the pep talk for the downtrodden. Lost your job? The, corpor- the culprit is a racial quota or greedy boss or foreign worker. You're the victim. That's a major takeaway from recent events in Har- Charlottesville, Virginia. This is obviously a dated article. Uh, hundreds of young white men who intoxicated by a cocktail of entitlement and white privilege expected to be running the country by now instead feel as the country is running over them. They worry that a society that pushes diversity, espouses liberalism, and worship at the altar of political correctness doesn't have any room for them, and the last thing they want to do is look in the mirror and take responsibility for their own lives. So they picked up torches and marched and shouted, You will not replace us, Jews will not replace us. This rank bigotry and anti-Semitism made other people feel victimized because they somehow thought they had a right to go through life without ever being offended by anything. The offended staged counter-protests, which made the original protesters feel victimized as if their right to free speech were being violated, and so on. The land of the free and the home of the brave is now the land of the aggrieved and the home of the picked on. The transformation is much more important than the question that captivates the attention of the left and the media as if there were a difference at this point. Do we have a white supremacist in the White House? A lot of my Latino and African-American friends are convinced we do, but I think they're wrong. What do they know? Some of them said the same thing about every Republican president since Ronald Reagan while turning a blind eye to outright racists in the Democratic Party. Also, Donald Trump has been in the public eye for more than 30 years, donating money to the civil rights groups, posing for pictures with Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, and supporting Democrats. I personally never heard anyone say he was a racist or a white supremacist until he became a Republican. That smells fishy. Besides, Trump presidency has an expiration date. In a few years, we'll wake up from this national nightmare. It's the culprit of victimhood that America should really be worried about. It wasn't just Trump, white supremacists, the media, local police, and activists on the militant left who emerged from the Charlottesville fiasco with their reputation sullied. The American spirit also took a terrible beating. We did... When did the greatest country on earth stop being a place where people with nothing but hunger for a second chance come, could come to work hard and build a new life? When did it become a place where everyone pushes their own set of grievances? As an American, none of the this makes sense. I thought we were made from healthier stock. There's, like, the previous article, this article has some stuff I disagree with, but 
at this point, you can't blame another set of people, another group, something that makes you, you can't make yourself the victim. I had friends growing up and in college who always felt they were the victim regardless of the situation they were in, that there has to be a reason for why things aren't going their way. And I feel like that's a lot of what people in this country are feeling right now. People feel like they need some reason that, like, it's not just you did something wrong, it's that something has happened to you, and that's your reason for this problem. I always think back to that, uh, that old South Park bit that I think they've brought up. I'm very behind on South Park. I've, I've never really regularly watched the show, but it's that whole, the guy going, take our jabs, take our jabs. Yeah, but they being, like, immigrants or people who are just taking your jobs, but I think in there, that episode, it was the illegal aliens were actual aliens or people from the future, I don't really remember, but people gotta stop being victims, or playing the victim card to get their way. It's like when... I don't know. I just am kind of sick of everyone being so thin-skinned. People just need to grow up, have a good sense of an argument, and if it, your argument point is not being proven, you can't just attack the other person or bring up stuff from the past. Like, 2016 is not an excuse anymore for your behavior. Red meat, we crave sustenance. Guys, we are not invading my aunt. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And that's why damn. I have a Foodies Watching Movies podcast. God Yo. damn, girl. Quiet. Killing it. Quiet. <laughs> quiet. All right. Yay. This is... I don't, do yeah, you wanna, I was pleased. Thank need, you guys for my new book. I really like it. We'll figure out how to better utilize this for Correct. the show. Mm -hmm. Correct. That was a fun trial run, guys. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We yeah. went through it together. Mm -hmm. So we, we haven't even to got into... The best part the of our whole entire weekend, which was the food. There's so much food stuff to talk about. Mm -hmm. We had a plethora of holiday celebrations as my family was in town. That was awesome. Yeah, my sister and her family and little ne my little nephew came in, and he was sick. Poor guy. I know. Mm -hmm. I felt so, so bad for them. Yeah, he was a sad baby. He was like a little baby Eeyore. Except for when he's around me, and then he smiles and gets super happy. It's the yeah. weirdest thing. Yeah. He just, you can make him laugh. Yeah. He likes men. He likes that yeah. baby. He does. Yeah. He loves his daddy. Yeah, he does. He's got a nice daddy who loves him. Mm -hmm. It was super sweet. So he was well taken care of, but it was really hard for everybody. And uh, we had huge celebrations and tons and tons of delicious food. My mom made her classic heart attack potatoes. I have a confession. Mm -hmm. They were not nearly as good as when we had them in Columbus. Oh, I you know why she didn't fired. put the, the French fried onions on top. Ah, I don't think crumble. that was it. It was the internals. The taste was not quite what she had last time. There was something about her ratios that wasn't mm. quite. Listen, those potatoes are in my brain, like cataloged as most delicious. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when she didn't live up to her own expectation, I was just kind of slightly let to down. your expectation. But it was her, to, yeah. to, to what well, she had already done. In yeah. all fairness. This heart attack potato recipe of hers is something that is constantly evolving. She never makes the same fucking thing twice. Like mm. it's always the same idea, but it's always like I'm this, gonna try this like, this time. Yeah, like yeah, last year she added the French fried onions, and that was a game changer. That was that good, was yeah. incredible. That. This year there was no French fried onions, but in, instead of just potatoes O'Brien, like chopped cubed potatoes there yeah. was also hash browns mixed in with it which mm. i liked that too i thought it was a good addition yeah. maybe that's what you didn't like that was the texture of the hash browns the, the texture i think was a little bit off i liked the um, texture it I... was just not creamy and um like uh sour cream slash cheesy enough how i like them i like I it know. to be i'll have to ask her what she know. did different what she normally does and figure out a, a way to expand this recipe and make it like glorious interesting though because sarah's mom made a very similar heart attack potato Well, today. I didn't get to have that. You did not, in my opinion, now Sarah can speak for herself, but in my opinion, you didn't miss much. I felt the potatoes were just, for me, a little bland. They didn't really have a lot of flavor to them. Well, that's what yeah. salt and pepper's for. Yeah, well, I was already like three huge bites deep before I realized it wasn't quite what I was looking for, and I was like, eh, whatever. I didn't get, have any home-cooked holiday Christmas meal today. Because uh, 
it didn't work out that way. I had a lot, you know, my son got picked up at noon by his daddy to go to his house for Christmas. And I had a bunch of stuff I had to do and I didn't get around to eating and I was going to go see my dad and I got whatever my little, my little cousin had. And I've been sick today. Mm -hmm. I haven't been feeling good. So I, uh, I was going to go and get a plate of food that my sister fixed me because they went over to my grandma's house and they always mm. have like a ton of food. It's so yummy. And I couldn't go because of timing and stuff. And that's going to be waiting for me tomorrow. There you go. So that's mm-hmm. going to be magnificent. Bingo. I'm excited. <laughs> but instead of a home cooked meal tomorrow, today I had Denny's. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> the Your only Denny's restaurant open, yeah. in the area that is open on Christmas Day. I don't know where to start about the Denny's because I feel like I can have like a 10 minute rant about the Denny's and I also can praise some things about Denny's. I got to tell you what. My food was so good that mm. I ate almost all of it and yeah. I got a, a ton of food. Yeah, you ate a shit ton of food. It was Yeah, I was looking at the menu and I was like, man, I really want this uh, turkey dinner melt sandwich. Mm-hmm. It had because I have I've had it there before with my we went there not that long ago randomly and I was yeah. like, oh, I got to go back and get that sandwich because it's limited and it's not going to be there for much longer. No, and it's like carved turkey on grilled pota- like grilled buttered potato bread with cheese stuffing and a cranberry honey mustard sauce that's like stellar it was so good with these seasoned fries that taste like curly fries from arby's but they're yeah, not those curly. Were good. oh man yeah. so i get there expecting to get this sandwich again and they're out of turkey but didn't they, tell us but didn't tell us until after i was already set on like ordering that and she's like oh we have a limited menu we're out of sausage we're out of turkey and she's like, I could try to see if they'll sub it for deli turkey, but I don't think they will. And I'm like, whatever. This is just the universe saying I need breakfast. Right. So I'm looking at the breakfast menu. And I'm like, man, all of these Grand Slams sound delicious, but I wish I could just like build my own because I don't want this shit. And then I like literally looked at the next part of the menu and it was build your own Grand Slam. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, shit. I watched that in real time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and we're it. in. We're in. Yeah, so I went with the scrambled eggs with American cheese, pancakes, white toast, Mm -hmm. and bacon. And it was so good. Oh, my God. And then we ordered appetizers. Mm. That That was a mistake. Subpar. That was a mistake. That's where my rant goes. There were some highs and there were some really low lows. Because, like, it took you, like... 20 minutes to get a refill on your water. That was infuriating. Took forever to order, and I was starving because I hadn't eaten anything, you know, mm-hmm. Took all even day. longer for our food to come out. The app came out like 30 seconds before our food. Yeah, that's always annoying. But you know what? At the end of the day, I was super grateful to have it. It was really good. Uh, it sucked that some things happened the way that it did, but, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, whatever. It was an interesting Christmas, guys. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I had a uh, I had a, a nice time with my family, and I'm I'm ready to move the fuck out of 2018 and yeah. into the next year. The next time people hear foodies watching movies will be just on the other side of the new year into 2019. So, mm-hmm. um, get mm-hmm. ready for that. Uh, I will say I had a delicious sandwich at Denny's. I had their build your own burger. Mm-hmm. And I was like, mm-hmm. man, I need to have pickles. Yeah, we took a picture of that and... uh, cross section of burger you chopped on through. Stacks. My bad. I guess I, <laughs> I guess I cut a really good picture. Yeah, is how they can say it that. was a good we'll one. We'll post yeah. it on our Instagram. But uh, when we get around to it, it was uh, you know, for some reason, I'm really into jalapeno on burgers now. <laughs> on just about anything. Yeah, I don't. It's weird. I don't know what's up with that. But I only guess three. I like. But yeah, because I don't want to burn. Yeah, to I know death. every time we get subway, <laughs> only three down the middle. Three, three singular jalapenos jalapeno, down the middle. Jalapeno peppers. I just Correct. it's for the flavor and not the heat. Hilarious. Don't judge me. We do. Well, you get I know you can judge me. <laughs> jalapenos and bacon. Untoasted. And bacon. Unto- untoasted. She's so savage. Heavy. Savage. God, how dare savage. you like tuna fish <laughs> with Grizz. mayonnaise? Yeah, that's a gross sandwich. When I go there, no. I get the steak and cheese like a fucking grown-up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do, but it's okay. You can like tuna fish. Turkey, you know what's ranch. funny? Here's here's Shout here's out. my favorite thing in the whole wide world about Veronica right now. Anywhere we go for food, anytime we order side by side, who orders better? You do. A million times. You know I will why? never deny it. You so, always order better so than me. So how are you going to sit here and tell me my tuna is bad when I guarantee you if you ate it how I made it, 
or how I guess Subway makes it, how I order it, you would actually probably dig it. No, because I don't like tuna fish. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, it, it still tastes like tuna. It's still I guess. tuna I, fish. Okay, you can't fair. get that tuna Any, out of the like, tuna. Let me explain how this works, Nate. Sure. Your point is is true. Like You always order better than me, only in circumstances where it's something that we both like. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes you order things that I don't like. That's true. So in those cases, to me, you aren't ordering better than me. Ooh, shit. But it, when it's on a mutually appealing looking thing, you always order better. Yeah. I remember that one That's time. That's why I, I always to... trust you. Like when I say, I don't know if I want this or that, you always say the right thing. That's like his magic power. Do you remember that one time we went to the Sophia House of Pancakes and oh, yeah. uh, you ordered something. It was a crepe or something. And I was like, no, you should have ordered the Nutella waffles or whatever the fuck it was they had. And it yeah. was out of this world. Mm -hmm. It's crazy good. You also have you have the best taste and you have the most expensive taste in food, I will Correct. say. Correct. Your food, once again, was more expensive than mine. Everyone's. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I just know what I like, I guess. Hey, that's life, man. Yeah. That's one that's like a way to live life. That's like what Dale Cooper from Twin Peaks would say every day, give yourself a little present. Mm -hmm. Even if it's getting a nine dollar sandwich as opposed to a five dollar sandwich. Mm -hmm. Four dollars, give yourself a present. Four dollars well spent, I think. Yeah. God, it was so good. <laughs> I added bacon on it and pickles and all kinds of shit. Uh so looking forward into twenty nineteen. Mm. We are moving into the second uh, phase of our season of foodies here. What are some things we should look forward to doing in this new year? I mean, is there anything on our agenda yes. that we want to accomplish? There is. The 90s bracket. Yes, that is happening. I said it before we started the season that I loved the doing the 80s bracket. And I wanted us to dedicate the back half of season three of foodies to a 90s bracket and i want to come up with a way to ask everybody's opinions on the best 90s movies and then we'll make a bracket and then we'll dedicate some uh, content to it Ooh, i love that maybe we'll put up a uh just like i want one a of poll those. on facebook and i don't think we should actually put up an actual poll Maybe, maybe, because I can't people add well, to the I poll. Well, I want people to give us suggestions, and yeah. then we're going to make a poll, and then we're going to vote. I like that. And then we're going to do the bracket. Like We're going to vote on what's going to make, what deserves to be considered. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, kind of how we did last year with how many votes made it onto the bracket. Right. We need to have people making nominations. Okay. Throwing yeah. out ideas. Yeah. And we'll dedicate an episode to that as well, like our ideas of what we want to do. Yeah, so we're going to focus a little bit of this last half of our season three on the ultimate 90s movie. There's actually a secondary bracket we could technically attempt to do, but I want to do it fast and not let it draw out. What? I want to do the 80s redemption bracket. There was a lot of complaints last year. I know. We want to do that too. We a lot of movies. We'll do that first. We'll do that first, okay. and then we'll move into the 90s. You know, keep mm -hmm. it chronologically in order here. I'm going to have not to. Not savages. Lucky for me, the printer that one time printed off like 27 goddamn copies of the bracket. So I have so many copies of the 80s bracket, I'll be able to easily weed out what movies have already been in the game. And they don't get to get put back in. If you were in that first right. bracket, you are they not. They shouldn't be back in. This is the redemption this is, round. This is people who never got a shot that should have maybe had been considered. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at you. Didn't Predator not make the list? I think was one of the big complaints. People were like, how are you going to not I have to look at the list. It's shit. been a long time. Yeah. It's been a while since I've looked at we that. We missed some, and we had some interesting things happen with that. But yeah, there was a couple ones that were pretty surprising that we forgot about. So we're going to do a, a second little mini 80s bracket redemption round yeah get and, as uh, many as we can together. we want you guys' opinions as well so whatever hit us up online yeah maybe we can like just post a thing on there that's like tell us your favorite 80s movies that didn't make our first bracket and then we'll post a picture of the bracket that's, that's fine uh, i'm just just riffing i don't sounds great. i don't mean to riff like that <laughs> uh well I don't know. I think we had some great food. We watched some good holiday classics. We made yeah. it through the season, guys. And we also made an F ton of treats. God damn oh it. I'm so God, glad you brought it up. Let's bring it up. Talk yeah. about we it. We made a lot of treats. Like, yeah. Uh, I can't. I'm trying, struggling to remember even everything. We wanted we made. to do something nice for our families this year. And since we are foodies watching yeah. movies, uh, we decided to make treats for everybody. Yeah. For our families for for the holidays. Speaking and of I can only make a are few you can take a treat break. Like I 
you know, I don't cook or bake all that often, but like the things that I cook or bake, I try to be like expert level at them. Right. I try to do like, you know. Yeah, you don't you don't cook much, but when you do, I don't fool around. It's on point. That's what I. That's what people tell me. So we made a yeah. motherfuck ton of these chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. Yeah, well, yes, I made a ton of chocolate chip. We made a ton. I made two very large batches of my chewy chocolate chip cookies mm -hmm. that uh, people seem to really like. And then okay, we gave those to, like, everybody. And then we yeah. made a ton of uh, crispy treats. Of we made three different, different kinds different of Rice Krispie treats. Yeah, because those are easy, and mm -hmm. you can get lots of different variations uh, and which good. one I we made? Which one did everybody made, like the best? I don't know which one everybody liked best. The first ones we got into was the Frosted Flake Lucky Charms combo yeah. pack. I didn't finish my piece because uh, it was just too much sugar. Yeah, it's a lot, but they're very tasty. The cereal they make, they're making all kinds of crazy hybrid cereals now. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have Frosted Flakes that have the Lucky Charms marshmallows in them. So that's what made, I've been. I had been living of off those. of. For the month of October. Yeah, that has been like your kibble. That that was like the <laughs> only thing that I ate in the month of October was that, yeah, Frosted Flake Lucky intense. Charm cereal. Yeah. You were sort of a, just like addicted to a little twitchy eye. Yeah, a little bit. Kind of it was there. real good. Yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> it's really good. So It's perfect cereal, actually, because it has the best things. Like, it doesn't have the shitty... Tr like Lucky Charm, like yeah, puffed it doesn't rice taste like thing. Grain. Right? No, it's crunchy Frosted Flakes. Everything's covered in sugar. Everything's sugar, and yeah. then there's the Lucky Charms in it. The marshmallows. Yeah. It's my jam, man. We're gonna We're fuck gonna the sodomites in, in the. the I've been busy all weekend. We like immediately after work Friday, uh, we went directly to Columbus, Ohio, where I spent the we spent the weekend with my mom and my brothers. Uh, it was a great weekend, you know. We had a we had a pretty smooth ride down. I was honestly shocked at how well the kids were, because you know they're four and five, and that's a four hour drive. That that doesn't that usually doesn't bode well for four and five year olds and the parents. But, uh, luckily we had the, the power of technology on our side and we had some, we had a DVD player in my car. Uh, we had like a portable, like headrest, uh, DVD player, you know, but it, it dual screen, like it, it's actually really cool. I didn't know we, that was possible, uh, believe it or not. Cause I haven't really delved into the car DVD world, but, Regardless, you know, we, we made it there. We, we had one stop. We stopped and got gas and some food along the way uh, and only managed to watch two movies the whole trip, which was awesome because, like, basically as soon as the second movie got over, we were in Columbus, and it was it was great. Uh, I think – let me see what movies – oh, yeah, they watched The Lorax. Oh, no, wait, that was on the way home. Spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, we watched – I know we definitely watched Incredibles 2, or they watched Incredibles 2, and they watched something else. I can't quite remember what it was. Oh, yeah, Wreck-It Ralph. Uh, Wreck-It Ralph and Incredibles 2 on the way down. On the way back, they watched uh, The Lorax and Finding Nemo. And, you know, that, that trip itself, uh, another smooth trip. We actually didn't stop at all uh, heading home. We in both of those movies, the Finding Nemo, the second movie, got finished as we were rolling into Lafayette. Uh, couldn't have gone any smoother. Uh, that last forty-five minutes of the trip, though, Nazira was Marianda's daughter. Nazira was quite a monster. She decided as we passed through Lebanon, aka our last food stop, which I I wouldn't have stopped. Regardless, it's Lebanon. It's half hour away from Lafayette. Like, there's no point in stopping at that point. <laughs> we might as well just keep going. But she decided to let us know she was hungry and then throw a fit because we weren't stopping. But there was nowhere to stop. So it's like just pure ridiculous. But that is the life of a five year old. You know, sometimes they don't really. 
they don't really dig your choices and they don't see the logic in your choices. And that's just part of being a kid. That's just part of being a kid. But anyway, back to the weekend, you know, uh, I, I had such a fantastic weekend. It's been a long time since I've had uh, a, a Christmas quite like this. Like it's been a long time since I've really felt the Christmas spirit and, you know, enjoyed being around my family. Not that I don't, and not that I actually like hate being around my family. It's just, I'm, I'm more of a loner. I'm more of a loner and I, I stick to my friends and uh, the people that are immediately around me. And I don't really spend a lot of time with my family. The most I really do is um, my dad, eats lunch with me usually every week or every other week, depending on how uh, his work schedule is going. But I had, I had such a great time hanging out with my brothers, hanging out with my mom and her husband, Tracy. Uh, it, it was just an all around good time. The kid, the kids loved it. Miranda loved it. They made, they made cookies. Uh, my brother and I, we went out to we, we ventured out into Best Buy this weekend and uh, I bought my house a new dishwasher uh before that however we were upstairs playing super smash bros on his switch and i had been talking about getting a switch and miranda basically forbid it but she saw me playing it and she was like you know what you're gonna get it anyways like what does it matter just go get it i was like okay so i went out and got a switch along with uh mario kart 8 and let's go pikachu so there's that I, I didn't really play it. I, I think I, I got a little set up that night after because we went out and uh, we saw some Christmas lights in the Columbus Commons, which wasn't a giant area. I was expecting a little more Christmas lights, but, you know, for like a little uh, in town like walking park, it was it was really cool. Like middle of downtown, really awesome light set up, uh, cold, really cold. But alas, it was fun. Uh, we decided to venture onto the streets where Tracy said that he knew of a great taco place. Uh, apparently, that taco place was completely gone. However, there was another place across the street that also happened to sell tacos. It wasn't the one he was talking about, but it was a taco place. Uh, Tio's Tacos and Tequila. Tequila optional for, you know, underage people. So we... We had a hankering for tacos at that point. I specifically had a hankering for steak tacos. So we go in, and of course, they have steak tacos. So what do I get? I get steak tacos. <sighs> if you remember last Monday on Journey Into Comics, we came at you live from LafayetteCon, the LafayetteCon before Christmas, and uh, we did an episode with Brian K. Morris, and... I intro I was introed into the show with a mouthful of steak tacos brought to you by the Guac Box of Lafayette. Uh, check them out if you ever see the Guac Box out. Definitely uh, get yourself some steak tacos or chicken tacos or any of their any of their food. It's all fantastic. Uh, but these steak tacos at Tio's were a one. They were great, great fucking tacos. I loved them. Uh, they also they also had great queso and great salsa. Uh, Miranda was complaining that the salsa was a little too hot. However, yeah, they were a little, it was a little hot, but it wasn't overwhelmingly hot. Like I had no complaints about it. I just kept eating it, uh, which if you know me, I'm not much of a hot person. I'm not much of a spicy or hot person, but it, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. It had enough tang to it that I could, I could handle it. Uh, like I said, the queso was great. The steak tacos were great. Oh my God. I ordered five steak tacos, uh, with some extra cheese on them. And, uh, man, uh, I, my, my, uh, eyes were a little bigger than my mouth. My stomach was cause I got to that fourth one and I'm like, man, that fifth taco, I really want it, but I know, I know it's just going to destroy me. So I, I gave it to Tracy. He ate it. Uh, and I was, I was quite satisfied, you know, I, I didn't make myself utterly miserable. I just, uh, I just, I just fulfilled my stomach. I, I am, I was completely and utterly satisfied. It was a great, great, great taco. Those, those tacos. I can't, I can't say how awesome they were enough, but alas, we went home. I enjoyed some more cookies. I set up my switch 
I didn't play any games. Watched uh, The Santa Claus. Oh, how I love that movie, The Santa Claus. That such a great Tim Allen movie. Uh, the, the Santa Claus two kind of fell short, you know, I mean, I was still a kid when it came out, but it was, it still wasn't the same as the first one. I could, I could tell it suffered to the modernization of Hollywood, you know, like they, they all, you know, how the older generations always say they, they just don't make them like they used to. And I get it. I get it. You know, uh, it, it's there, there's it, there's a difference in quality. Obviously, the picture is better, but I mean, I don't know. It's just they're not as hardy anymore. If that makes any sense at all, the 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 films I watch nowadays are just not as hardy as they used to be. The I mean, it, and it's it's so weird because acting has come such a long way, but regardless, it's just not the same. I don't I don't get it. The story writing's not the same. I mean. I get it. I mean, you have to reuse and recycle a lot of concepts, a lot of stories, and like everything's basically already been written. Like, what stories are left to tell? But regardless, it's just not the same. But uh, and then for whatever reason, after the Santa Claus was over, they they completely skipped uh, the second Santa Claus movie and went straight to the third one, which I've never seen. Uh, it stars Martin Short as Jack Frost, I believe, but I've never seen it. I uh, don't really want to because I, I just feared that they just further went down that modernization path and it just wouldn't be the same. It's like it's like back in the day I, I had uh, – when I was a young lad, we had the movie Air Bud. And then uh, Hollywood made another Air Bud and then made another Air Bud and then it made – Spa they made the, the Air Buddies movies, which led into Space Buddies and Snow Buddies. And it's just like, let's milk this fucking dog as long as possible. <laughs> as weird as that is to say, they they milked the hell out of Bud. <laughs> oh, that's that's such an odd image. But yeah, it's it's I, I feared that they would they basically did the same thing with uh, the Santa Claus three, the escape clause. Despite still starring Tim Allen, like I'm a huge Tim Allen fan. I loved growing up with uh, the Santa Claus and Home Improvement and all of his all of his other movies. Like I like uh, Joe Somebody. If you ever uh, stars ha uh, Hayden Panettiere, Panettiere, however the fuck you say his, her last name, uh, as a young young girl, uh, has. Um, Oh man, I'm I'm forgetting his name right now. And I, my uh, Patrick Warburton as uh, the bully of the movie, the the technical bad guy of the movie. Uh, gr I love Patrick Warburton. His voice is so fantastic. Uh, his I mean, if you if you really want a great representation of Patrick Warburton and his voice, just watch The Emperor's New Groove. <laughs> I don't care if you're an adult. That movie is fantastic. All these Disney, all those older Disney movies are fantastic, and I consider that like, to me, like Golden Age Disney was like uh, all the, uh, like the Beauty and the Beast, the Little Mermaid, Lion King, all that, and then we moved further down the line into uh, what I would refer to as the Silver Age, and I think I think the Emperor's New Groove falls into the Silver Age, like that's like El Dorado and. Uh, all the Pixar movies, despite despite the Pixar movies all being absolutely fantastic, I still put them in the Silver Age because they they didn't really come first. They, that was like the next generation, and it, it's it's cool how like like Disney's progressed. Like they very rarely put out a bad cartoon flick uh, for kids, you know, and, and especially Pixar. I don't think there's a Pixar movie I don't like. I, I honestly don't think there's a Pixar movie I don't like. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, that's that's my uh, talk about Disney and movies and all that. So we woke up in the morning and uh, my mom made us some pancakes. Uh, we had some fantastic chocolate chip pancakes uh, made with Ghirardelli, Ghirardelli fucking dark chocolate, which I'm not a dark chocolate person, but if – if you bake it with something, it's it's always good. Um, I had it. Oh, those pancakes were so fluffy and so good. My mom makes fantastic pancakes. And shortly after that, we uh, we left, 
headed home. Only to stay home for a good maybe hour. We got we got home about one forty five and we had to be at my my uh my grandma's in in Delphi on my dad's side. We had to be at her place around three or four. So I took a good nap. About two forty five to three twenty I took a nap and then we headed out. And I, and once again I had I had such a great time on my dad's side as well. Like yeah, th- this year has been such a good year for me and family and it just feels good. It feels good to be around my family again. And, you know, it's been a long, long time since, I mean, it, it's been hit or miss ever since, uh, about seven years ago, uh, all, going on eight years, my grandpa passed away and he was always kind of like the glue that held the Tyner family together. He held, he held us together. He, uh, he was the light of all the holidays. He loved he loved every get together, every little thing because we we would get together on basically every holiday: Father's Day, Mother's Day, uh, any any day that involved that couldn't possibly involve family. We got together. We had a cookout. We did something. And uh, once he passed, uh, everybody kind of just started focusing inwards on their own family. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. We're all getting older. We all have our own families now. I mean, and I'm I'm joining those ranks. I have my own family now with uh, Miranda and Maverick and Nazira, and you know, it's I get it, but it's it's just it's still very nice to get us all together and all enjoy it. Uh, I felt very weird uh, the last few years at Christmas ever since he my grandpa passed. I very I felt very weird. I felt kind of like an outcast for some of the choices I've made, like dropping out of college and, uh, get being heavily tattooed and always like not coming around as much, you know, but that's just me. That's just how I am. I mean, it, it, I think, I think that's something that, uh, I got from my mom's side of the family. I mean, they're, they're very family oriented as well, but all, all three of my brothers and I, we kind of just do our own thing. on our way home from dinner i had scarlet in my truck she was complaining that her stomach hurt so i decided to stop by uh walgreens and get her some like kids pepto because i knew we didn't have any at home so we get to walgreens we go to the kids medicine aisle we find the kids pepto she sees the package and it's got a picture of bubble gum on it she got all excited (gasps) bubble gum medicine all right you know and at the time, she, I mean, yeah, she said her stomach hurt and stuff, but she didn't seem that bad, you know. Oh, here come the dogs again. She didn't seem that bad. So we're walking up to the register. Uh, the guy starts scanning our medicine. Uh, and then all of a sudden, Scarlet says, I'm going to puke. Which Scarlet is pretty good about knowing when she's going to puke. But also sometimes she likes to, you know, just for attention, she likes to say stuff like that. Uh, and then she, you know, then she's fine. So she says, I'm going to puke. So I start scrambling. I'm grab, I'm trying to grab at the bags, you know, the, the plastic grocery bags they got there so I can get something for her to puke into. And I'm, you know, I can't, I can't get the bag open. And all of a sudden she's just like, uh, what did she say? She, she says, I'm going to puke in the morning or something like that. And uh, tomorrow morning, or I'm going to puke when I wake up in the morning. I was like, wait, so you're you're not going to puke right now. I stopped reaching for the bag and the guy's still scanning. And then I, I'm getting my wallet out to pay for it. And then she says, Oh, I'm going to puke. I'm going to puke. And I was like, wait, are you really going to puke this time? So I start reaching for the bags again. I'm grabbing at the bags. And then she says, yeah, I'm going to puke if I can't have my bubble gum medicine. And that's when I was like, all right, she just wants to taste this bubble gum medicine. She's not really going to puke. I was like, okay, Scarlett, just chill. We'll be out in the car in a second. As as soon as I'm done paying for this, we'll go sit in the truck. I'll get you some bubble gum medicine. You can take a drink of water, and then we'll drive home. You know, so I quit reaching for the bags again. I get my wallet out. I stick my card in the reader, and there it goes, Blah! like spray projectile vomit all over the floor by the cash register. It just just Blah! and it stunk and it, ugh, 
it was we had chick-fil-a so like there's chunks of you don't need to hear about the chunks that's that's fine it was just all over uh and meanwhile like i see i see it i hear it i'm reaching for the bags I grab bags and I'm trying to get the bags open in front of her face while she's still projectile vomiting everywhere. So she's puking all over my hands and uh, it was, it was disgusting. It was a nightmare. And like your kid throwing up in a public place, like you, you feel terrible because like you feel like there's something you should do. Like you should be the one cleaning it up. Like, you, hey, can I use your mop or whatever? You feel like you need to do it, but at the same time, you have a four-year-old there that's sick to her stomach. You need to get that kid home, and you, you know, so it doesn't keep happening. So, I I rush Scarlett to the bathroom. We get her cleaned up, uh, and then when I come out of the bathroom, this the puke is still there on the floor. They put like a a wet floor, you know slippery floor sign around it um but i'm like uh is there something you want me to do and the guy's like oh no i got i got this and uh, they, they were very nice about it i i i do give them a lot of credit because i i don't handle puke very well in fact i'm surprised that i didn't barf with her puking all over my hands because ugh, bleh. i just i guess i just had such an adrenaline rush of trying to make sure she was okay that I my stomach was fine that at that moment but I don't know it was it was a nightmare it was a nightmare I I, I felt awful just walking out of the store while there's a puddle of puke on the floor still and there's people at the other other register just like eyeballing it and eyeballing me as I'm walking out and luckily I don't ever shop at that Walgreens there's Walgreens right around the corner from my house so like if I if I'd have been at that one then I'd, I'd have been mortified because I would I would have had to clean it up because otherwise I'd I'd have known the people living around me like I don't know why do I give a shit why would I <sighs> now we're going into my my mental issues but this is stupid this is stupid the point was she threw up and your kid throwing up in a public place is just always a nightmare there's there's nothing. It's like a, a worst, the worst case scenario would be like, uh, if it was like in a ball pit or something, something, you know, uh, uh, what do they call? Uh, God damn it, I can't even think of the play place like at a, at a Burger King or something, you know, that would be a nightmare because then someone has to crawl in there to clean it up. This was at least in the middle of a floor, easy to get a mop to it, although it was in like the the rug. She threw up in the rug, so I don't know what they did about that. But I don't know. I walked out. I washed my hands of it. And you, you got to think this is it was right across the street from a pediatrician's office. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of sick kids that come through that Walgreens, and it's a Walgreens also. You know, it's, it's a place for sick people. So I imagine they've dealt with vomit in their store a lot. Maybe I don't know. Anybody listens? It works at a Walgreens. Do people puke in Walgreens a lot? Does that matter? Is that, is that irrelevant at all? Who gives a shit? How many times have I said that already today? God damn it. This is the worst thing I've ever done. All right, one last story before I let you guys go. I'm holding you hostage now. So uh, Scarlett got a hold of the, the scissors. I don't know. She's, she's done it before. I don't know if we had a podcast at the time when she did it the first time. So I don't know if we've talked about it at all. Oh, hey, there she is. You coming to join me? Is... Well, I have to, don't I? Or else you're going to get mad at me. No, it, well, I'm almost done anyway. But oh, well, good. Uh, but I, I guess this works out perfect. Uh, I'm sorry, i got to set her microphone up now. Uh, this works out perfect that you're coming in right now because uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Scarlett getting the scissors. No. Um, and I wasn't home. I wasn't home when it happened. Is your mic on? I don't know. What mic is it? Oh, there we go. That's oh. one. Yeah, it's on. Okay. Uh, I wasn't home when it happened, so I I can't say too much about it. Um, but maybe you can just kind of give us a recap of how and what happened. And 
I'll jump in when I... God, I can't even remember now. It was traumatic. Traumatic? Very traumatic. How is, how is that traumatic? This isn't the first time she's done it. It's worse this time, though. Last time, she actually didn't do that bad. Yeah, that's true. So the first time Scarlet cut her, cut her hair, uh, she only, like, cut the very ends. And it, it, it legitimately looked like half-decent bangs. Yeah. She, but she, this time, it was terrible. Yeah, she, she cut her bangs off, like... Almost down. Like, it, like maybe if, like if an any, inch. if any of you know who uh, Diane Antwoord is, it's yeah, it was like Diane the, Antwoord the, the female. I, I kept less than that. So she, she had it fixed too. Uh, you brought her to, to your friend who cuts hair, and she no, tried... it wasn't her. Oh, it was, okay. She wasn't working. Oh, okay. But to her, her. Yeah, her work. Work. What I don't know. What is studio? Is it a studio? Hair cutting? I don't know. I am so far out of it. This this episode has been just a shit show. I'm sure. Yeah, I know. This is the, you know you don't have to pop like that. You see that? Anyway, so she you got want, the scissors. You no, know, he he begs me to come down and do these things with him, <laughs> and then he's just a dick. Well, I mean, just don't pop into my microphone. That's all I'm asking. If you want me to do this, I'll do whatever the hell I want to. Okay, so. I don't know. So she came in the bedroom. I was still in bed, I think. No, I was sick that day. Oh. I was in bed. Wait, and was that before she got sick? Or... Yeah, it was. Because it was like a week before I she was, was sick. Yeah, this was when I was sick before this last sickness. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, because I, um, I, talked about the, I talked about the stomach bug we passed around. Yeah, already. this was before that. Okay. And I, she was like looking in the mirror or something. And she did something to where like I just knew something was up. And... uh yeah, and then she comes up to me, and her hair's gone. So we have a uh, like on our kitchen counter, we have the the like the wood block with our knives in it, and there's a pair of kitchen shears in it, and that's what she got to. Mm -hmm. um, and she cut her bangs very very short. I compared it to uh, if any, <laughs> and I. I was I'm uncomfortable making this comparison, but I also feel like th with the hair color and everything, it's pretty accurate. Um, the the prostitutes <laughs> in American Psycho, um, not the one from the call service, the one he picks up on the side of the road. Uh, what are you insinuating? Nothing. I'm just like she's got that weird like the really short bangs, which I don't know if that was like in style in the 80s when this movie was supposed to have taken place or if that was just a weird haircut but she's got these really weird short bangs and like shoulder length hair and i i still think scarlet's bangs look a lot like that now but even after getting them fixed there's just nothing they can yeah, do yeah there's there's they nothing to, to fix cuz she cut them so short um which then I, I, it may have been the same day we we went down in the basement and then we found some like orange hair. We we're like, where the fuck did that come from? And it turns out, so uh, Olivia got this, uh, my size Anna doll from frozen and Scarlett cut her bangs too. And she said that she wanted, she wanted to get the hair out of her eyes. And that's why she cut her own hair too, was to get the hair out of her eyes. Mm -hmm. So, um, then to pile on top of all of that, uh, the next day, uh, Mark and Livy were over. Or was it just Livy came over in the morning? Hmm. Now I don't remember. All I know is I remember Livy was over and uh, I was working out in the garage maybe. And I came into the kitchen from the garage and I look at that knife block and the fucking scissors are gone again. And... Uh, I went into the living room. The girls were sitting on the couch in the living room. And as soon as I walked in, I saw Scarlett hiding something behind her back. And I, I caught them with the scissors. Luckily, they weren't cutting any more hair. I can't remember what they were trying to cut. I think they were trying to open something. Yeah. Like food, a, a snack or something. Whatever like it is. So now scissors. Scissors are just gone at our house now. We have to hide them, hide them. Not just in the knife block anymore. Which, you know... You'd think we'd learn our lesson before, but yeah, we didn't. Which I, I guess I feel fortunate that it was just the scissors that they're pulling from the knife block and playing with. Uh, because there are some very sharp knives in that knife block. 
which I literally didn't even think about that until just now. And now I'm nervous having the knife block out on the counter. Oh, I mean. What's going to happen if she tries to cut her hair with a knife? I hope she's not that stupid. She is. I mean, she's four. I guess. I guess it's possible, right? Yeah, she's an idiot. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the story of the the scissor incident. Um, I know it's not that exciting a story, but I, I'm sure... Every parent. I was going to say every Probably parent. Most of them. Maybe not every parent. Some parents get lucky, but a, a I'm sure a lot of you have a very relatable story about the kids getting into the scissors. Maybe not cutting their own hair, cutting a sibling's hair possibly, cutting I'm, I'm a dog's hair. About, I'm scared Scarlett's going to cut Livy's hair. Oh, yeah. So if, if Scarlett cut Livy's hair... That would be the the end of like me and my ex getting along at all. Like it would never be okay again, uh, and she, the kids would barely be allowed at my house, e- even less than they are now. So, yeah, that that is a scary thought. Which thank God that didn't happen when they got the scissors down the next day. Uh, oh, very I easily could have. I think Livy would probably not let that happen. I would hope so. But, I don't know. You never know. But, uh, well, yeah. You, did you have anything you wanted to throw in about Christmas or about... I, I, this This whole episode's been a nightmare. Just because of how little sleep I got last night. I Whose mean, fault is that? N- nobody's. It's Yours. not even my fault. I, I had a migraine. You didn't take anything. What do you take for a migraine? I don't know. Stuff. I don't know. I, I honestly, God, don't know what you take for a migraine. I've had like you have th- a phone. Google three it. Three migraines in my life, and I just I was I was getting nauseous. I so I sat up and I don't know. I kept playing Fallout. That was the other thing. The the the, the PlayStation was distracting me. That was the only thing that was distracting me from the throbbing, awful pain in my head. Uh, so I just kept that going until four thirty, I think. Yeah, I know it was late, but uh, that's that's when finally it, I still had a migraine at four thirty. But I was finally like, you know what, fuck it, I, I I have to get some sleep. So, it's time for brews with dudes. Ah, juicy. So right now, um, I suck. Chris brought over uh, 450 North's fresh fruit raspberry vanilla uh, milkshake IPA. Uh, he's not drinking it right now because he doesn't like it. He he well, would I call love it you guys otherwise. Yeah, he would call it pawning it on us, but I actually like it, so I appreciate I it. I enjoy it. It's okay. Um, that's our pregame beer. We're gonna dive into. Uh, I got a couple couple guys from uh, 18th Street. Um, and then I think our champion for the night is going to be the king in the north. Ooh, king in the north. Imperial Stout. Oh, yeah. Fuck, yeah. That's going to be a good one. Um, the good friend uh, Bernie Sanders just dropped this guy off. Ain't no tang. Sour India pale ale with guava, orange, and lactose. Okay. Um, Sour milkshake. Uh, something tells me we've had this one on the show before. Which is it? Um, it looks like under crown. It's hard telling because the text is terrible. 18th Street does that every now and again. I'm like, why did you choose that font? Yeah, right. I can't fucking read that at all. I see, I see one from 18th <laughs> Street in there that I know we have had before. Yeah, I figured some of these will be for drunk catastrophe. Right. This one, what is it? Uh, nickel something? <laughs> Nickelback. <laughs> I don't know. I know this is a new one, so we're gonna we're gonna enjoy that. The camera's much further than mine usually is. Give it a good shake. <laughs> so we got some fun. We got some fun things. Uh, this is our second podcast of the day. Yes. Um, we did a... It wasn't necessarily an episode, but we did kind of an intro to Dungeons with Dudes. A pilot, if you will. Kind of like that. We just wanted to uh, kind of get a feel for it. We did a... Um, it's a game called Dread. It's like a role-playing game. Um, we did that at Laffy Con. So we did that as like a... Uh, Premiere to the idea is the first time that we said something about it um, to to the world. Um, And then today we made the page and started. uh, We got through a card game. It was a lot of fun. It is official. 
So Dungeons really Dungeons like, with Dudes I, I is live. It. I noticed the cover image is like the old network, like all the shows, and it's, yeah. it's still got butt stuff and literature on it. Sure, yeah. And immediately Nate's like, like I need to fix that. I'm like, oh, so you are paying attention. <laughs> um, I've been referring to it as we're we're starting the uh, the Dudes Caucus inside the Journey into Comics Network. We just keep adding dudes shows. The dudes caucus. The dudes caucus. <laughs> you got, you got, like you got it. like like six or some shows, and then just a bunch of dudes shows. Like, what are they doing over there? That, that's hopefully what podcast free is going to end up becoming. Because we're dudes, and we we got yeah. something. We got a couple things in plan for the uh, podcaster fee network. Oh yeah, yeah, we do. Um, there's one that I don't think you've necessarily mentioned, so I won't mention it yet. But we have talked about doing a metal show. Um. So that's going to be fun. Uh, Very excited for that one. Yeah, because we we need we need to do our review of uh, all that remains new CD. We do. <clears throat> this is the last one with Ollie, isn't it? Yes. Final. Sad. One. He died. Uh, I think a couple days before it was released. Big. Ass. I wonder if it was just a publicity so thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Hey, dog. What if you pretended like you were dead so we could sell more albums? All right. I just saw some random article the other day talking about how Avril Lavigne's actually dead and they have an impersonator as her and all this shit. It was weird. It <laughs> hmm. was stupid. But I like a good conspiracy theory, yeah. though. They were talking about how like she went from like her classic punk style to you know now she just kind of conformed to a different style and that it was it was someone she would use as a body double. So she was found dead and they just covered it up and now this girl was Avril Lavigne. Hmm. Yeah. Or she was. just like matured. Grew up. Yeah. Yeah. Boo. Yeah, I like my angsty yeah, Avril. Don't get me wrong. Isn't she uh, married to uh, Chad Kroger now? Or did that one end too? Of Nickelback I, fame? I don't know. I don't know. I missed that part. I'm very sorry. <laughs> she married Nickelback guy. Yeah. That guy from Nickelback. Wasn't she eye. wasn't she the one with the with the good Charlotte guy for a while? Uh, uh no, that some was, 41 guy. I thought some that was, 41 I thought guy. that was Nicole Richie was with It's with it's the, hilarious that when Charlotte you think of guy. like like one of the, one of them is married to uh uh I I'm drawing a blank on her name now. Uh Cameron Diaz. Weird. It's so funny that that's <laughs> like it's like you're like wait a minute. You're telling me that someone actually married the lead singer of Nickelback? And it just sounds so silly. Yeah. It's like, wait yeah. a minute, the guy in Good Charlotte actually gets with girls? You're just saying, <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure they do. They do. I think they were They were before, I guess, Good. good what would you consider Good Charlotte? Were they? Pop punk. Pop punk? Pop punk. Proto emo. Proto emo. <laughs> before all the emo bands started I molesting like young girls. I like they it. had like the classic emo look, but not the like sound and feel. No. To it. Yeah, you're right. Dude, I, I saw I saw a good Charlotte back a couple like last month, beginning of the month, and f- fantastic show. I bet they put on a good show. I like their old stuff a lot. Yeah, and oh, they yeah. played a lot of it. Yeah. They played songs well, that you I wasn't gotta. Ex- I wasn't expecting them to play like uh you remember Riot Girl? No. Nope. So it's off of um, Young and Hopeless. I remember it. Nope. <laughs> I bet I would if I heard. Probably. They, they played that and Story of My Old Man, and both of those songs are like obscure fucking songs for them. Was but, it Newfound Glory, the one with the really nasally guy? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yep. from <laughs> that song, <laughs> specifically. <laughs> they're all, they're all, in my head, they are all in the same same group so Miranda <laughs> yeah Miranda had a great suggestion Miranda's Since, gonna listen to this and be like I'm gonna go whoop Nick's ass <laughs> probably a, oh, she's coming down right now to whoop her ass she heard you from upstairs <laughs> time for it has nothing to do with my opinions on Good Charlotte or Newfound Glory <laughs> so Miranda texted me a great suggestion a little bit ago good job uh, saying should we invite Bernie and Meg so, of course, that's, that's what I've been over here doing is texting them. Are they going to come? Uh, I texted Bernie, who is in my phone as President Sanders, and uh, he, he said they're at brokerage right now. I'm like, after! <laughs> right. Do it! I feel yeah, like he has to work pre-game. tomorrow. What, Brett? I said brokerage would be the perfect pregame for them to come to drunk catastrophe. I'm not a cat. <laughs> it might smell like one, though. 
Are we ready for another beer? I'm ready for another like beer. One, two, We're all just yeah, kinda, yeah. I've just been patiently waiting for the first beer. Are you using your little flight thing again? Yeah. We sure are. We right. all are. Um, let's start with... Three Ooh. Floyds Cheer Team Ale. This oh, very this fruity yeah. and may we say juicy hop character in this IPA is unrelentingly delicious. <laughs> Miranda, do you want to be our right, that is weird Do you want to be our pourer? Do you want to be our pourer? I can I can pour. Do we have a rinse station downstairs? The, there is one back there. Looked a little gross. <laughs> <laughs> Water's water, man. <laughs> No. Oh, Tell that to Flint, that Michigan. Yeah. I will argue that it's not. There's two sinks back there. Yeah, there's two sinks. Yeah. It looked like the water's coming out of a gross ass hose. That's I no, took, there's another I that's a hose down second. there. There's a there's an actual, there's an actual bathroom sink back there. I feel like that <laughs> bottle should have like a 1920s medicine in it that contains Chloroform, cocaine or <laughs> yeah, something. You got ghosts. Some cocaine. Yeah. You got ghosts in your Kids blood. You should do medicine. cocaine about it. <laughs> Kids cough Sorry, medicine has like heroin in, in it. I don't, I don't smell it. Smell anything. You, you're also a woman and you smell everything. My nose is also plugged up from you know rain and allergies, so I can't smell <laughs> shit. Well, that's good because Yeah, I can't that's smell. Weird I also have. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Miss me with that bullshit. Yeah. Cats? Bastard yeah. agrees. Yeah. Talking, talking garbage? Hmm, garbage. Talking oh. shit. <laughs> Cat shit. Less sigh. <laughs> oh, I thought you already took a drink. That's why I didn't give you more. No. <laughs> no. This is how Nick Bitch. pours for himself compared to how he <laughs> pours for his friends. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, we're friends. I have more in mind. <laughs> mm. That's interesting. It's because you yeah. say things like, oh, we're friends. It had some, like, fruity in the middle. Text. Cat. Bastard, give us your opinion. Take a big swig, brother. Take Dick's portion he didn't get. <laughs> 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 I think he missed you, Nick. I'm okay with this. Hey, bud. Oh yeah. Oh, open up the sweatshirt and let him like crawl inside. Actually, open up the sweatshirt and the Miami Vice shirt and just let him nestle. Let him snuggle in. I feel like the Miami Vice shirt is being saved for later. Oh, it is. He knows. <laughs> I saw that and I'm like, that seems like some. That seems like something special. Nick is. And uh, now you have a cape, so it's even better. It gives me more layers to take off. Hell yeah. So that way it takes you longer oh. to get naked. Okay. What do you What do you think of this, bro? I need another taste. Do it. He said they're heading back home to the Lame. He said it's a hoppy lager. Or a hoppy ale. Yeah. It's an IPA. That's not bad. The very fruity and may we say juicy hop character in this IPA is unrelentingly delicious. <laughs> this looks like the artist Skinner. He did the artwork for uh, um, one of Mastodon's albums. He just said High on Fire. They usually tell you the artist's name. Usually they. I thought they used the same one. They usually do, but this one just looks so much it like different. old boys. It kind of looks like almost like the Once More Around the Sun artwork, too. That's who mm -hmm. did it. Yeah. That's okay. His, yeah. yeah. Okay. Have you seen my Necronomicon pop-up book? Not yet. Mate, oh, Skinner I have, did. I have. I have. Okay. He did the Necronomicon, and all the artworks like yeah. this, and it's a pop-up book. I do remember seeing that. About this beer, though, it's I don't know. Nothing stands out. I yep. think it's. I think it's got a pungent fruit flavor. Yes. Like yeah. I think the the fruit is, is is really strong. It doesn't necessarily sit on your tongue or. Um, on the on the back end, though, all I can feel is hop and bitterness. Up front, I, I do agree. get a little bit yeah. of fruit, but nothing distinct. It doesn't. It's not lingering, though. It kind of is for me. 
Hmm. It is not bad. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I am. That's interesting because you're like, wrong. All like, right. It's like your opinion. Man. All right. Well, I guess. Like your opinion, I guess that's man. what that is. No, it's, it's definitely opinion. not bad. I like it. Um, but it to me, it's just hop. I get a little bit of fruity, but then it's just hop on the back end and hop lingers a little bit. Which, I mean, hmm. I like for an IPA most of the time, but this doesn't have that distinct flavor I've been really into and been spoiled by by a lot of the beer companies we've been going to. They go for like a specific fruit flavor or a specific hop flavor. And this one doesn't say what hops they used. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say very much at all. Gonna... Floyd's doesn't like to tell you what hops they used. I mean, sometimes it's painfully obvious. Painfully. Um... But no, I'm not really sure what this is. I'm gonna look it up on uh, Untapped. See what they got to say now, did about they sell it. Us just by the bottle. I have no idea. It was a gift. Tex spoils me. He just every time he comes over, he brings beer. Speaking of gifts, can't wait to drink that uh, Kim Trail. Holy shit! Yeah, I don't think we've talked about this yet. So one of my buddies hits me up and says, "Hey man, I'm getting ready to go to New York uh, for the holidays, and I was wondering if you wanted to go." Grab a beer beforehand. I mean, we don't hang out very often, but I was like, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm down for that. So I go out to meet him, and he hands me a, a Dark Lord variant chemtrail, and he's like, I wanted to give this to you. I'm like, did we have that on our Dark Lord episode? Why? I don't think we had the chemtrail. Okay. Um, I remember talking about it. And he's going on about, about how, like, online it's selling for, like, 700 bucks. Per bottle, and he's giving it to me, and I'm waiting for the catch. <laughs> and it eventually gets to, he's like, just buy me a, buy me a beer, and, and we're good. Granted, we were down at 6th Street during the 12 days of, of Christmas, <laughs> so his, his fucking pint cost 12 bucks, but it's a $700 bottle. He just gave it to me. So we're sitting on, on a really, 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 what I've heard is tasty Bottle of Dark Lord that was just given to me. You were drunk at Dark Lord Day. We did try it. I don't remember. No, I, oh, I know. I know. What does that variant taste like? I don't know. <laughs> I, I can say I don't remember from drinking it at that Dark Lord That was during Day. the brown era. Yeah. Um, I don't really remember out. the flavor brown from drinking it at Dark Lord Day. Um, Dark Lord itself was a little sweeter. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the, I guess, the teaser episode of Crucial Tunes, uh, the music show. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what else to say. Uh, <laughs> hosted by uh, myself, Chris Plant, from Kids for Sale podcast, and my best bud, Larry Ruzenko. Larry, say hey. Hey, what's up? Uh, so this show is something we're going to start doing uh, on a every other week basis. Um <laughs> Exclusive. But so we figured it's December already, December of 2018. Uh, what better way to start off, kick off our show than to do an episode of just our, our 2018 top 10 favorite albums that came out this year. Um, there's been a lot of good ones this year. It was actually, I don't know about yourself, but it was, it was hard for myself to narrow it down to 10. Every year I just do a 10. This is the first year that I had to do a 20 in my life. Yeah, it, there's there was a lot of bangers this year, and like it, it's not just. I mean, we're in a pop punk band together, so there is going to be. I I in my list personally, I know there's a couple of pop punk albums. I got a few, yeah. But you know, I feel like we listen to a, a decent enough variety of music that uh, that there should be a good mix and and uh, everything. And I also have some honorable mentions that we can do at the end of the episode. And, sure. Um. The first thing I wanted to do, though, uh, I don't know if you have any of these or not, but I, I came up with like a list of albums that like I had really looked forward to because I liked the the other bands, you know, the band's other works or people had told me all about it, and then I, I listened to it and I was bummed. Sure. So I have a few of those that I wanted to like right off the bat. I'm gonna say, and everyone's this is everybody's gonna shut it off right here because I'm gonna say Sleep. Did you listen to the Sleep album this year? I'm not into Sleep. It, it's it's a stoner metal band. And uh, I guess they haven't put out an album in, what, 20 years or something, something like, like that. that? Yeah, some crazy shit. And everybody was like, oh, sleepy. 
I, f- I hate. I'm not gonna say I hated it, but it's just it's it's not my thing, man. I don't I don't get it. It's 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 stoner metal. It it all sounds it's uh, slow and, and I, again. It's, <laughs> a lot of people are, a lot of people are going click right now just because I yeah, said well, that. But whatever. They can turn it off and smoke weed and listen to slow metal. Um, but in the, you know, another one that was a real disappointment to me uh, was I don't. Do you you listen to Ben Howard at all ever? Nope. Ben Howard is this, like a singer songwriter does acoustic stuff and uh i love him i love his old stuff he put it out a new album this year and i just i don't get it i don't get what direction he's going with it it's really super crazy like uh, overboard like overproduced i feel like his other stuff was a lot simpler and it sounded a lot better sure. but, um i don't know I'm, is this is this going anywhere this 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 disappointing albums of 2018 <laughs> do, you, do you have any disappointing um, albums I don't know if it came out this year. I think it either came out this year or really late last year, but I was really hyped for that Code Orange record, and I was not into it, like, at fucking all. There was a Code – I'm sorry, I'm eating ramen. There was a Code Orange album this year, and it was not as good as their – their last one um, – oh, shit. What was their last album called Uh, the, with the green – I'm King. I am King, yeah. That, that one rules. That one rules. So I thought this album was going to rule, and it sounded the like, follow up was not like a, a shitty version of Fear Factory. Yeah. And it is, it's, it which, wasn't into it. I, I, didn't, I didn't hate it, but yeah, that was that was a disappointment. I was expecting more from them. and For sure. Because um, it got, like, unreasonably big really fucking fast. Well, this, they signed to Roadrunner, which oh, yeah. Roadrunner... Roadrunner has done a lot for getting them on, like, the mainstream circuit for, for a hardcore band, you know, that... And uh, actually, it's funny, like when they first got signed to Roadrunner, I, there was like they were quoted saying like, oh, we're not going to be playing these stupid festival circuits with like Killswitch Engage. I don't I think they called out Killswitch Engage specifically or something. Now, all they play but, is festivals. But now they play festivals with Killswitch Engage. And, like that's all they do. I know. So they they really. Uh, Why would you not want to do that? I don't know. I don't know. Because they're they're a cool hardcore band. They can't be no, with the mainstream. No, they all look like they're like in the Matrix and shit now. I know, but I'm saying like that, that's they built their image up as like this cool, completely non-stream hardcore band, uh, non-mainstream, non-stream. non-stream. Yeah, you know, non-stream. Um, but now they're they're in the mainstream now, and it's, it's anyway. So yeah, their album was disappointing. But uh, let's let's skip on to these the the actual let's the good stuff, the top the good ten. Stuff. Um, so I'll I'll go ahead and kick mine off. Um, my number ten. We're going. I'm guessing we're going from bottom to top. Sure. Do you have an order to yours, or are you yours um, just like ten really good albums? I, well, I took my list of twenty and took off ten of them, and it was super tough. So I had to take the ten I liked the most. There's, I'd say, the t- top three are solid, but otherwise, I'll just kind of go okay. with it. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, my number ten album coming in at number ten is one that actually just got released about I want to say two weeks ago, um, late no, I think it was either late November, or early How can December. You have an album that's that fresh because I really like it a okay. lot. Actually, I have um, one of those two. <laughs> uh, mine is Architects. Holy hell! Cool. Um, no, I'm sick. Actually, it is super good. Like really well produced. Like genty uh, metalcore album. Um, I don't. I I really like Architects. I've liked everything Architects has ever done, and this album probably not as good as some of their older stuff, but it's right up there. And mm-hmm. it it definitely came in as one of my favorite metal albums of the year. But I do have a couple more metal albums on my list, so. Uh, what's what's your number ten? Belmont. Belmont. Ah, the self-titled Belmont album that dropped summer, what, August, maybe some, somewhere around summer. August. It was like right when you moved here, ish. Oh, it was later than that because yeah. I I moved here earlier in the year and Belmont dropped. Oh, well, okay, I was wrong. The, their first single did drop pretty early on when I moved into this house. Sure, but the full the full album didn't drop until maybe July August oh. somewhere in there because okay. I I went to the release party and I want to say that was in August. It's a great album. It's it is really good. Super like complex sounding almost for being right. like a pop punk record. There's a lot going on. Right. It's really good technical drum work on it. Their their drummer he is... can cool it occasionally. Yeah, but I like it though. I, I do. I'm really into it. Their drummer is phenomenal. But... I like the sound of that guy's voice. Actually, a lot. I'll go, I'll go ahead and just like give it away. That that was my number three. So we don't have to revisit it oh, later okay. on, but yeah, uh, yeah the, you do that. I'll say, oh, that's mine. I I too. loved it. I it is my number three album. It's on a my great list. album. So, um, my number nine. Uh, I'm. I don't know. I know you were, when we talked about this a couple months ago doing this episode. I know you mentioned this was going to be on your episode, uh, on oh, on your list. Um, Jesus Peace. 
Ah, uh, Jesus Peace is on my list. What's, uh, I, what's the name of that album? Only Self. O- only Self. I, I was going to say because I accidentally wrote Only Song, so I knew that wasn't right. Only Self. Uh, Jesus Peace, it grew on me. The first time I listened it's to it. It's fucking intense. The first time I listened to it, I was like, it was good, like it. but I didn't. I, I wasn't crazy about it. Like, th- so between you and our buddy Andy Reid, you guys were both telling, "Oh, you got You're gonna love this album." And I listened to it, and I was like, yeah, "It's it, it's there." You know, it's cool. It's sick. but but then the more I listened to it, and here's the thing: if you're gonna listen to this album, this only self by Jesus Peace, I highly recommend that. Like, don't put it on while you're like working around the house, or don't put it if you have time. Sit down with like a decent pair of headphones or on a good stereo or something, and actually listen to it. Because what caught me on this album was the the whoever the producer is on it. I wish I would have looked it up. The producer, brilliant. Yeah. Like the the effects and stuff and the the weird spins he put on like just the drum effects and everything. It changes so much throughout the album, and there's such a good mix and stuff. He really he took just like a and don't get me wrong, it's a really good metal album. Oh, yeah, but he took a good metal album and turned it into art with well, all like the. They signed a fucking uh, Southern Lord, yeah, which is like Son, like Wolves in the Throne Room, like real crazy shit. Mm-hmm. So like, it's like the first time like a normal basic hardcore band signed to that label. So they made something real fucking nuts out of it. Yeah, it's it's, it's it is really it's great, a great record. But uh, okay, uh, what, did that come in on your list? It did. Okay, on these ten, yeah. Uh, what do you want to do for your next one? Uh, Silent Planet. Um, what's it called? When the End Began. Never listened to Silent Planet until a month and a half ago. Ever. Yeah. And just, I see their name on all kinds of shit. I'm like, what is this band? And I saw like one or two of their videos. Like, oh, wow. I really liked that album a lot, too. Uh, I, it has a very, since we already talked about Architects, has a very Architects sound to it. In fact, there was one song on the album that I I texted you even. I was like, oh, this sounds like this Architect song. But, it sounds exactly like that. But, the, re- song. but the rest of the album is really good and uh I, it didn't make my list mostly because it's got that weird so with all those genty metal bands mm-hmm. there's like this weird effect that they put on everything that almost sounds like they're playing like in a garbage can it's like a really metallic kind of oh, reverb yeah. sound and that that's real heavy on that album and i, I it, it kind of it was hard for me to listen to the whole thing but a track at a time it is a phenomenal that's album a really good album i like it a lot um my number eight uh, I this could be controversial, uh, just because it's somebody that uh, it's it's that extentation. I don't know how to, is that how you pronounce his name? That X X X extentation, the rapper that got shot in Florida like over the summer sometime. So there's controversy behind him because supposedly he he well I'm not going to say supposedly because I don't know whether to believe it or not. Allegedly, same thing as supposedly. Well, no, supposedly <clears throat> kind of says that I doubt it. Allegedly means. Okay. It could okay. be true, Fair you know. Um, allegedly, he beat his pregnant girlfriend, and there, that's that was the big controversy. Sure. But, but post mortem, after he was shot, I guess she has come out and said that it was not true. That it was, you know, it was made up. Blah 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 blah. So I don't know. I don't know if it happened or not. But anyway, I so, feel like she might have been like paid to say that. Maybe. But either way, I was against listening to it for a while until I read up that you know it could be fake, and I was just like, you know, whatever. Art, separate art from artist, you know. I so I I listened to the album and I the, it's the album the question mark is the title oh, of the you album. Sent me some stuff. Like I, that. I told you to I told you several times I to listen I to like, it. Oh oh yeah. I love that album. It's it's like a really artistic rap album. You know, it's sure. he does a lot of some of it's just basic rap. Some of it's like really there's a lot of cool like acoustic guitar stuff on it and it's. I don't know. It was Travis Barker plays drums on something. Yes, and it's he nuts. does, and it's awesome. And that's the thing too. So the the track that Travis Barker plays on, he like goes into this like screaming thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's and really it's, cool. It's 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 a good album. I love it. I loved it. It's, that's my number seven. Or I'm sorry, my number eight. Not to backtrack for like to the first segment real quick, but hands down by a landslide, the most disappointing album of the year that I was super hyped on was Under Oath. Oh, that's on my list. <laughs> Of albums that you like? No, of disappointing. Oh, because so I was like, what are you, that album is fucking no, terrible. No, it's, it's awful. <laughs> it's it's Target metal. And when I, like, Target, the, the big box store metal. And I say that because... Target metal. When when that album came out, 
they were uh, like you go to back to the the TV section of the store, mm-hmm. and that their music video was on all the big screen TVs in the back of Target, and I was like, uh, this this album is just a paycheck to them. That's all it is is a paycheck, yeah, well. and it sounds like it too. It doesn't sound any better than that. I hated it. It was nope. terrible. But yeah, what's your that number? Was your seven? No, my number eight was oh eight. Oh, I'm gonna go with eight. Um, Post Malone. That's on my list. That's my that's my number six. I did not like Post Malone for a very long time. Didn't really know much about Post Malone. Just saw him on everything. Like yeah. Memes and his sketchy ass face and shit all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, fuck this guy. Um, I heard a bunch of songs on the radio not knowing it was him. I'm like, oh, this yeah. song's tight. This song's tight. And I look at him. I'm like, these are all Post Malone? <laughs> Dude, like, yeah. Post Malone's so, great. <laughs> so he got famous for that White Iverson or whatever. And I don't like that song. I, th- I think it's oh, boring. That song is sick. I, th- I think it's boring. So I just never really bothered with him much. But then, uh, I st- like you said, I started hearing some songs off of this. It's Beer Bongs and Bentleys, which sounds like a rap album that I would hate. That does that's, does not that title does not pique my interest at all. That title is but, fantastic. <laughs> but I like I started listening to it. I was like, holy shit, this is a really good album. That <laughs> there, it's 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 I think my top rap album of the year. Yeah, that's my, and that's my number six for the year. It's Post Malone, Beer Bongs, and Bentley's. And on, and on top of just how much I like it, my kids love it too. So it's on at our house all the time. Because it's awesome. It's great. It really is good. It's smooth. It's super catchy. Yeah. Parts of it are like fucking hard. Yeah. Like, and he just he also seems like a super likable dude. Like he just seems like he's he seems cool like with everybody. He, he, yeah, he's a fuck. He's dirty as hell, but like he seems like a super nice dude. Like he just chill with everybody, and okay, that's the that. impression I get from him. That's the impression that I get. Um, my number seven. I think I heard you cross it off your list before we started. My number seven is Vane Error I Zone. Did take that off because it just. I like these other albums better, but that album is fucking. It's so heavy. it's so good. It's so good. Um, I actually just saw Vane a couple weeks ago. And uh, I, I missed almost their whole set. I got the last two songs, and I'm really bummed that I missed it. I'm, I'm going to see them again. How did that work? Did they open? Weeks. Yeah, they opened. Oh, oh, weird. Well, they opened for uh, – god damn. They opened for the, – so the headliners were Turnstile and then Every Time I Die. Uh, the middle band, I find it, the one you like that Angel I hate. Dust. Angel Dust. Angel yeah. Dust fucking rules. I, 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 Angel can't, Dust is awesome. I can't do Angel Dust. It, it doesn't it – doesn't, they don't do anything for me. And especially live, I did not like them live either.